All right, welcome back, Tactical Mother Flowers, to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Nicholas Tan. Dr. Tan, or as you might know him, the Survival Doctor on Instagram. By the way, if you haven't checked out his profile already, you're missing out. Check it out. The Survival Doctors on Instagram. All of Dr. Tan's links are going to be right below in the description. So check it out. Uh, But I'm going to read off a little bit of Dr. Tan's resume. It's an impressive, impressive resume. I was reading it saying, gosh, damn. So first of all, um, right now you're doing your residency uh, in Michigan. And I'm going to leave the exact hospital out, Dr. Tan. Uh, You can fill us in, but, you know, I'm just going to all about discretion. Not only are you a doctor, uh, you also have an impressive background in the military, Canadian military, and that's the Canadian Grenadier Guards. You've actually received uh, commendations from Lieutenant Colonel Command um, for excellence beyond duty and work overseas. You have a kind of incredible humanitarian background as well. You've uh, done humanitarian work in Tanzania, uh, Kenya, I think I saw Zimbabwe on there as well, Zanzibar, Kenya. We'll have some stuff to talk about, but, um, you know, I could keep going and going. Wilderness medicine, advanced wilderness medicine. Dr. Tan, welcome on to the program. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, first and foremost, you are a Canadian living over here in the States. I've met a lot of Canadians. You guys are good people. What brought you over here from Canada uh, to live in the States? Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, I initially got a scholarship from Michigan State and uh, decided to head on here if they were going to sponsor me to um, work here in the U.S. and uh, study to be a doctor. And uh, I like Michigan so much, I decided to stay for a little bit, get all trained up and uh, serve the community. How long has it been uh, since you first went into medical school until this point? It feels like forever, uh, to be honest. I think I'm going on year seven. I'll transition to year eight. Yeah, I, so it's about eight years just total from medical school day one until residency until you're yep. your own doctor pretty much, right? Absolutely. So it's, uh, it, it goes by super fast, but uh, you look back on it and you, you're kind of in awe and all the things that you've learned, all the people that you've uh, met and lives changed. Yeah, I was and- looking at your resume going over this mm-hmm. and kind of thinking about it. Um, and I thought a lot about this. The amount of stuff you have to know to become a physician is mind boggling. I spent six months in AMP school and I feel like I'm a very smart man. So when, when I hear somebody spending eight years and then all the subsequent years that you're going to spend learning, you know, guys like you don't stop learning. Um, it really is a mind boggling feat that you're going through and have gone through already. So congrats. Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel like uh, the most part of it is curiosity. A lot of us um, in any field are just very, very curious and um, we're always pushing kind of the, the, the boundaries. Uh, for me specifically, I'm uh, pushing the boundaries of uh, a subset of emergency medicine called wilderness medicine and uh, even going a little further doing something called survival medicine where you're learning how to manage medical emergencies in situations that can kill you faster or if not as fast as the underlying medical condition. That's fascinating stuff. And that ties exactly into most of the guys and girls who watch our channel, I know, are, you know, either military or private, something or other, or law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be the type of audience, I think, that, you know, obviously that you're you're catering to as well on on your um, Instagram tag and Instagram handle. By the way, do you have a YouTube Mm -hmm. yet or? Uh, We do have a YouTube. It's everything's under survival doctors. So it's plural. Uh, We kind of... um, branch from different specialties, uh, whether that's physicians, first responders, ex-military people, um, and also um, our EMS uh, colleagues and firefighters, search and rescue. So um, I'm kind of like heading this group, uh, but we do take specialties uh, from all over the place. And we have uh, an expert panel that we're rolling out um, in the coming year. That's that's impressive. That's really cool. Um, so yeah, wilderness medicine and stuff like that, man, I really think that it's it's the best stuff you could know. Cause like you said, you know, you might not always be where a hospital is handy located, right? You could be mm-hmm. out in the woods or it could be some kind of situation where you just can't get to the hospital. We saw how it was during the height of COVID around, you know, in yep. Michigan and here in New York, you didn't want to go to a damn hospital if you didn't have to. Um, 
So for you to learn a thing or two about, hey, how to take care of yourself or your family probably wouldn't mm-hmm. be a bad thing these days. Absolutely. Um, just to give you some background, uh, March COVID hit uh, Michigan pretty hard. And uh, I was about to go on vacation. I haven't seen uh, my father for over five years. And it was like a uh, time that I was uh, headed over to the Philippines to see how he was doing. COVID hit really hard. And I was called back to, to work in the hospital on the COVID units. The month goes by, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And I ended up uh, on month three on the COVID ICU. So uh, our hospital over time went from, hey, we're, we're having a little segment that we're managing COVID to the majority, I would say 70 to 80% of the whole hospital, a COVID hospital. Wow. Um, so when we, we talk about people uh, not wanting to come to the hospital, even at that height, we were seeing people um, kind of passing away at home because they were so scared of getting COVID in the hospital. People getting strokes at home, heart attacks, all the normal stuff that people would go to the hospital for. And um, I think a lot of it was uh, a lack in education saying like, hey, um, this is not really serious. And then all of a sudden uh, you're gone and your uh, loved ones are picking your body up. Yeah, that's incredibly sad. You know, COVID affected us in so many ways, but, you know, (laughs) that's one of them. And the unfortunate part is, you know, I think when, I mean, you said it yourself, you said it better than I could say it. When people are staying at home because they're too afraid to go to the hospital, something that they don't think is a big deal all of a sudden becomes a big deal. And by that point, maybe it's too late. And yeah. Um, so how was it? I mean, what was it like working in a COVID unit? You said like 70, 80 percent mm-hmm. of the hospital was COVID patients. What was that like? Yeah. So um, to be honest, it was very um, nerve wracking, to say the least. This was uh, something that was, uh, we saw it in the news. We knew that uh, it was overseas and then made its way to certain borders. And then all of a sudden just landed on our shores and it just blew up, you know? And not only that, like uh, we weren't prepared for it. I don't think any of the medical systems here were prepared for it. So um, safety was a huge issue. I knew I was young, but uh, about three weeks into uh, the COVID pandemic in the Southeast Michigan, Detroit area, Uh, I found out that uh, one of our colleagues, so this is someone who trained at the hospital I was in med school with, um, he passed away at 37. Uh, So that kind of like uh, put light into um, how crazy things and how serious things were uh, because we didn't have proper PPE. Yeah. Um, So, and we didn't have proper diagnostic tests at that time. So there's a lot of cross contamination where um, people were coming in for like, let's say shortness of breath. They have a history of smoking and whatnot. So they were admitted to the regular floors thinking that it's a COPD exacerbation. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, it's a COVID and everyone taking care of that patient, including um, just their, their, their bed, their, their bed buddies, you know, like mm-hmm. the people in the room, like a lot of people getting these exposures and getting sick. At one point we only had two phlebotomists in the whole hospital. So our hospital wow. beds are like over 400 beds. And we had two people drawing blood because everyone else either quit because it was too tough or got sick or passed away. So we had two for, for a long time. So our labs were like all, all crazy. And that's just one department, you know, wow. uh, lots of fatigues uh, from the physicians, lots of fatigue from every worker and uh, everyone without uh, proper um, protection. So um, I'm also on um, TikTok as well. So I, 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 I uh, kind of retold a lot of those stories on that platform on saying how uh, we improvised um, safely the, the PPE stuff. Cause um, three, three months plus, um, exposures to COVID. Like I, I didn't get, uh, I didn't get sick. And uh, at the same time, uh, it was really sad to see that so many people, even like across the street from me, didn't believe it was real yeah. when there were literally hundred people's admitted and, uh, many people dying from it too. Yeah. It's, it's the damnedest thing. And I know that some of, you know, my audience specifically might be the types COVID ain't real. It's coming from my guns. But, you know, at the same point, it's very real. And, you know, guys like you have seen it firsthand a little bit too much. Um, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen some couple of patients come around my way with it and it's, it's frightening. And it's, it's, there's some, yeah. And so when you're saying you improvised your PPE, were you dealing with just those little surgical masks or? So, um, so the N95 is what we had, but we had like maybe one if you could grab it every so often. Mm-hmm. So um, there were different ways. Um, we had to dig up different research studies on how to kind of um, reuse your, your N95 
uh, how to reuse your, your gowns. Um, um, the way we saw patients were a little different. So if they were, everyone was COVID positive, you wouldn't be downing and doffing all your gowns. You would just go to COVID room to COVID room and kind of segregate it that, that way. Um, and then all these studies came out with, um, is it aerosolized? Uh, do we need eye protection? All that stuff. Uh, so there was a lot of unknowns and a lot of um, concern because you're in the room uh, for a good like three to five minutes, multiple different patients, and some of them are coughing up a lung, you know, and uh, you're trying to like uh, kind of have your space, but they're in a, uh, basically a negative pressure room. Um, so even though it doesn't get out into the hallway, there's a lot of particulates in that room itself. So you guys didn't really find that you were getting exposures just due to the eyes? No. So um, what we did, we, we were very careful at the get go. So everyone had like goggles and like face shields uh, to kind of reduce the burden on the N95 itself. We would have the N95 plus a surgical mask on top yeah. of that yeah. or some kind of material. So it would get into that and less uh, on the N95. Um, then I would uh, kind of have uh, five N95s uh, and every day of the week, I would kind of like use a different one. And every three days you can, um, it, it would be technically safe to use. Um, there's also peroxide, uh, aerosolized peroxide that, that people have been using. And then towards uh, the middle of it, uh, there was such uh, distress from providers and like nurses because they're in more than the doctors are um, that our hospital kind of uh, said, OK, we're going to help with this. And uh, they uh, did heating. So there's a very specific temperature that kills the, the virus plus UV light. So there was like mm -hmm. a double treatment. And mm -hmm. then they would bring these are all recycled N95. So you would get it after. And uh, hopefully like the strings and everything wasn't warped from the heat and stuff. And then uh, that's what we were dealing with for almost two months. It's uh, it's freaking crazy to me how unprepared us as a nation were for this uh, for this virus, man. It wasn't just us. It was like every country throughout the world. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. Yeah, so I, I don't think we're going to forget this anytime soon. No, no. But, you know, like with every tragedy, I mean, even going back to like the Titanic, right? Like they didn't have enough lifeboats, but gosh, damn sure. Now we got more lifeboats than we need on ships. Right. So um, there's always, I think, a silver lining, even in every tragedy, but yeah. So speaking about the, um, the virus, man, I don't want to spend too long on it because mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, we've beaten with a dead horse by now. It's yeah. Everyone wants it to go away. So Speaking of having the virus go away, um, vaccines, the mRNA mm -hmm. specifically. Yes. What do you know about this stuff, uh, Doc? What can mm -hmm. you tell us about this new and special mRNA stuff? Mm -hmm. So for uh, those of your viewers uh, kind of tuning in from out of the country, I'll speak very specifically to the formulations we have here in the U.S., uh, specifically the Pfizer, because that's what our hospital system uh, is giving out. Um, so I got that uh, about two weeks ago. Um, and the way it works for people who don't know what it is, because I think there's a huge concern being like, hey, it's integrating with my own DNA, you know, it's making me into something different. Uh, but really what mRNA is, it's kind of like um, an instruction manual to make something, right? It's not changing the factory. It's kind of like a, an order to make a product, right? Mm -hmm. So you go to a factory, you have the order, the factory makes it, and then you have your product. And that product is what your immune system like recognizes. So if it's a baseball, you know, your immune system's like, I know what a baseball looks like. I can pick it up and throw it away, right? Um, um, uh, two kind of components that it would need to integrate into your DNA and change who you are genetically, it would need something called reverse transcriptase, which is not in the vaccine, and integrase that integrates that um, genetic material into your DNA. And both of those are not in, in the vaccine. So really, it's an instruction manual to make something very specific so your immune system can recognize it. And then uh, another question we get is, um, hey, it's, it, it's been less than a year. Um, is that too soon? Um, are there uh, concerning side effects and, and that type of thing? Um, so what, when we kind of address that, we look at um, kind of efficiency versus like time. So I think the biggest assumption is like, um, hey, if a vaccine has been around for like uh, three years, it must be safe. But in, if in those three years, there's only, let's say, 100,000 participants or something like that. Um, the data is still for 100,000 people. Um, and when you have like millions of people taking the same thing, um, and then you're kind of uh, mar marching off uh, what their side effect profiles are um, and um, using diff different demographics. So um, I think they did a really good um, um, job kind of 
developing their protocols where they included elderly patients, they included people with chronic conditions uh, and not just healthy, normal people. Um, so when you look at, um, is it safe for the regular person? Yeah, because they've, uh, they've given it to people like 80 and above. And that's the demographics that we want. And I think uh, one of the, um, the um, things about the vaccine is, hey, does this mean that I'm immune to COVID? Will I get it? Can I spread it? And that's not what the study is looking at. So uh, that's something, a very distinct thing that uh, people should know. Even if you get the vaccine, like many other vaccines, it doesn't mean you're not going to get it. It doesn't make you superhuman, like brick wall, can't get it. What it does very specifically is it reduces the chance of you going to the hospital for it. Mm. And that's what uh, typically vaccines are made for. Um, so when you get it, it's a very mild reaction because your immune system's already like, hey, I got that baseball. I know what it looks like. I'm going to take it up and chuck it out. Um, so that, that, that's what the vaccines are there for. It doesn't mean that uh, you're not going to feel uh, sore. It doesn't mean you're not going to get some of the symptoms, but it does mean you have a less likelihood of dying from it and going to the hospital for it. And that's the whole purpose of this, because what will break America's back is not if you get COVID or not, is if 100% of the hospitals fill to the brim of COVID so they can't treat anything else. Yeah. So you have people dying at home with, from heart attacks or people with uh, issues even a car accident, not having a ventilator to sustain their life because we're, we're kind of overrun with that number. And uh, we got a picture of it uh, when COVID hit here, uh, at least in, in my area. I know my buddies in Florida, my buddies in Texas, they, they, they understand what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm sure some people have an idea as well. But when you're at that capacity, you really don't have the, the staff, the resources to treat other things when your hospital's full and a lot of your staff are sick. So that's what we're preventing. Like you said, I think we found, we saw really a kind of a glimpse into what a shit hit the fan scenario would look like. We lived through it. And, you know, I mean, we came out okay this time. Hopefully mm -hmm. people are going to get more educated now. And that's one of the things that I really like about what you guys are doing at Survival Doctors is educating people and doing yep. it in a way where people are going to want to learn. It's not these boring lectures it's not sitting through three hours of BS. It's, hey, this is the down and dirty of, you know, how do you pack a wound or how do you apply direct pressure or whatever it is, save people's lives. And that's what it really is about. Absolutely. Uh, because at the end of the day, that's who, that's who we want to know this stuff. Because um, just to give you an example, uh, one of my buddies was uh, one of the doctors in the Bay Beirut explosion. Mm. So he was driving home to, to get to his kids after a shift. And uh, he just noticed that uh, there was lines of cars, everyone stopped. And then he saw that big old mushroom, you know, and um, he, he was really worried for his uh, kids, his family. And um, I remember him saying like uh, he had to like rent a scooter just to get into the city and to see what was going on. And there were first responders, there were like ambulances and stuff. But because of the debris, no one could get to the people and no one could get out to the hospitals. Uh, so he was saying like, there's so many like bystanders just trying to make improvised tourniquets, putting pressure, but no one really knowing what to do. And uh, I feel like uh, that really puts things in perspective because like uh, me, I don't have any kids right now, but if I, if I had a family of my own, that's something that I would want them to know. And uh, to be able to say like to my kid who may be like maybe eight or seven, this is what you need to do to save your life, to, to save mom's life and to everyone to have that uh, education and something that's not complex, you don't need to know all these uh, medical stuff, but if you know what to do and why to do it in a life threatening uh, situation, then that's good for me. That's good enough for, for my family, you know, and that's something that uh, we really do want to spread. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good way of putting it. And you got to look at it that way is that, you know, it could as easily be somebody that you love or care about. So wouldn't you want, you know, this bystander to, to know a thing or two? to be a good Samaritan, to do their part as a fellow human being. And Absolutely. I think most of our audience combined is that type of sheepdog mentality, thinking about, hey, I want to lend a hand and do the mm -hmm. right thing. Speaking about sheepdog mentality, man, um, tell me a little bit about your time in the Canadian Grenadier Guards. Yeah, so uh, it was a really serendipitous like situation. I was... Uh... Uh, I think 16 or something like that, no direction, kind of felt like uh, I wanted to go to university, not a dollar to my name. And uh, I was on a volleyball team 
And my captain, uh, he was, um, he said like, Hey, you need money? Like join the army. Like, uh, he was in there. So I was like, all right. Uh, so I went there, uh, checked it out. You basically get paid to learn high level skills that no one else knows. And, uh, just the way he carried himself and a lot of the people that I met there carried themselves. I was like, yeah, I'll join. Uh, so they paid for a lot of my education and, um, just, just right at the bat, like everyone knew that, um, I found myself geared towards like medical things, like helping people, uh, that type of thing. And, uh, one of our, uh, lieutenants, he was like, Hey man, you should uh, check out uh, dart. It's the disaster assistance response team. So I was like, that sounds awesome. You're in whatever country, 24 hours, um, providing relief. So I was like, all right, that's sweet. I'll, I'll uh, train up for that. And, uh, kind of went, uh, uh, a little bit away from like, uh, I did like uh, close quarter combats, all that good stuff, but kind of, uh, veered towards like, um, survival stuff, cold weather, uh, warfare, and then um, a disaster relief. Um, and uh, when uh, the Haiti earthquake hit and all these uh, uh, natural disasters started happening, I kind of um, kind of like learned what we were actually doing on the ground. And it felt like a band-aid, you know, like you're going there, you're making sure everyone's okay, but you leave and their infrastructure is just like demolished. They're, they're, if you're gone, like the they, people start dying. Uh, so that's when I really got into like humanitarian work uh, seriously in international development. And um, I found medicine through that. And you went to um, Tanzania, Kenya, Zanzibar. Uh, mm -hmm. I was in South oh, America for a little South bit. America? too. Now, what was it like living and working in these third world nations? Yeah. So um, I was in uh, Kibera, which is one of the most dangerous and poorest slums in the world. Uh -huh. um, just to give you an idea of how bad it is, um, like when you when you go to places like this, you're not wearing much. You're wearing like a shrabby old like T-shirt and shorts. And despite that, because you're a different uh, race or you look different, people think you have money. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my professors has been doing this for 20 years is walking down uh, the street midday. So like 2 p.m., something like that, um, gets clocked over the head, is bleeding on, on the street. Don't know where he went. You know, the Kibir is huge. Don't know where he went. Next day, like uh, uh, people like uh, like find him and bring him to like a hospital, you know. Um, so like that's the that's the kind of situation you're looking for, and it like just the smell in that type of area. It's it's like the like the the plumbing. There's no it's non-existent. You go there and you feel physically sick because it it just smells like like crap, like garbage, you know. And um, you work in these places and it, it's horrible. But at the same time, you have these instances. You meet these people who despite this, wake up every day with a smile, wake up with a type of passion and drive that you can't find in uh, places with luxury, you know? And uh, it's those people that I would fight next to, those people that I would want to help because uh, these are the type of people who can take nothing and change the world. And I think that type of, um, uh, that type of person is what really drove me to say like, hey, this is something that uh, gives me pure joy um, and I may not be a hundred percent in line with their mission, but just being in their presence and knowing what they do and going through the process of helping them go through that has really, um, opened a different gateway for me. You know, like here in the U S or here in North America, people work, get money, buy a house and whatnot. But, uh, I don't think a lot of people have a mission, you know, and I think that's yeah. different once you leave the, the, the military or any kind of like, uh, really profound thing that's above yourself and um to be able to say like hey i have a mission i i'm confident i don't know how i'm gonna do it but i'm confident that i'm gonna do it and um that's that's kind of the, the road that i'm heading because I, i'm not stopping at being a doctor you know like like this thing is not a, a, an official specialty this is kind of like a hobby that doctors do wilderness medicine is kind of like a hobby that people do but i want to take it further to really change lives and to get people uh trained up I think a guy like you, um, you've accomplished so much already and you're not really, are you even in your thirties yet, man? I just turned 30 last year. I'll be 31 <laughs> this year. Okay. Yeah. So you, uh, it, it must come from at least somewhere, um, come from the military service. I really think that they do a very good job of instilling that into people. And most of the ex military guys who I've known, whether it's been Canadian, American, Brit, uh, you guys are more highly motivated than the average person. You do more so, yeah. with, uh, with your lives than most people do. And I think, like you said, mm -hmm. having a mission that's well put. Um, 
Doc, I noticed that you went through some defensive driving while you were in the military service as well. What was yep. the purpose there? Was that the overseas training or? Um, that was mainly like, um, like very basic safe driving and also a little bit of evasion, nothing crazy. The advanced courses that a lot of my buddies who went to Afghanistan and Iraq, those guys uh, were talking about like uh, uh, reverse driving, whipping the car around and like getting out and uh, protecting your target. Uh, a lot of my buddies did uh, private protection um, as their main tasks overseas. So nothing high speed like that. Uh, but uh, it was funny, the budget when I left, um, kind of went up a little bit. So they mm. were able to do a lot more cooler stuff. Um, but, you know, uh, I traded it for medicine. And uh, I think like looking back, like if I have to get the, the training as like a civilian, I'll take it. But um, some of my buddies did get really awesome training when I left. It's always been funny to me to see the difference between Canadian training and uh, United States training. You guys seem like you do more in certain areas uh, than we do. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but for example, you know, I've, I've trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff in Canada a couple of different mm -hmm. times. And the guys I met over there were saying they had to go through like two weeks of a pretty intensive course in hand-to-hand -hand yep. stuff. Is that something that you experienced in, in the guards mm -hmm. or? Yeah. Okay. So in the, in the guards, it's kind of like a longitudinal type of experience. It's uh, like, it, it's not uncommon for us to, to drill it up and like just choke each other till we're purple in the head for like, for like uh, the, the whole weekend, you know? Um, but there, there are uh, close quarter combat, very specific hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff where you go through all that uh, multiple attackers. We were very fortunate to get, um, I forget which department they were from, but they were American. And I don't think I can disclose the mm -hmm. type of organization they're from. Um, but a lot of the training we had with them was uh, uh, blinded scenarios, um, multiple attackers, uh, a lot of throat and eye stuff, and uh, a lot of takedowns and uh, fighting with your weapon, uh, weapon being pulled from you, that type of stuff. Um, so that, I think, uh, was really good because uh, doing it over and over again, it became very instinctual where I felt comfortable being like attacked by like a few different people and putting most of them on the floor before, uh, before uh, I was reaching for my weapon. You Canadians like to fight and you're good at it. Has it uh, come in handy yet at the hospital at all? Um, so in the hospital, I think uh, the best thing to do is to talk the people down. Um, so I haven't like, and over here, I'm like afraid to get sued. Like that's my, <laughs> my one thing. Like I don't want to touch anyone because I don't want to get sued. Uh, but I think uh, the one thing that I really um, kind of focused on and uh, kind of, uh, uh, built up as a doctor is talking people down and distracting them. And uh, I haven't been able, to, I haven't needed to, to use any of those skills. Uh, but I think it helps when the patient knows that you're very calm and you're not scared of them. I think it changes something in them. Uh, Cause I if the nurse is leaving guys. and everyone's leaving and you're going in and you're not, you're not, you're like knife handing them. And then you're yeah. like, no, you know, the situation and uh, you're not budging one millimeter. They change their attitude. Yeah, they can tell. They can tell that you'd almost kill them and then have to put them back together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I want to touch, I want to just go back and touch on your time over in these third world nations. I mean, mm -hmm. what can you take from that work that you were doing in a, a really downtrodden environment, bring it over. Now you're teaching emergency medicine to yeah. all types of sheepdogs over here. It's got to be the type of thing where you look at what happened there. You look at what happened in the early stages of COVID here. You can even yeah. look at where we're going, you know, as a society, and I'll just leave it at mm -hmm. that. What can you now bring from all of your experience to um, where we are more than likely headed? Yeah. So w one of my uh, good friends and uh, uh, survivalist, Donnie Dust, he has a very like, um, he has a pretty good catchphrase. You, you know more, you carry less. And I feel like that transfers uh, directly in this uh, topic. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the Maasai people. That's where I did my primary research with. They're a nomadic group in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, even though Western medicine is in Kenya, is in Tanzania, uh, the majority of what they seek medical care for is very minimal. So my job with them was to say, hey, what conditions do you actually see doctors for? And it wasn't a lot. They, they, they focus very uh, highly on preventative medicine um, and also uh, a very... Uh, um, advanced like knowledge in plant medicine so medicinal uh plant medicine and um in addition to that like even broken bones 
they they would go to like uh, bone setters and stuff like that and that sounds kind of like witchy and stuff like that but when you break it down and see what they're doing they're doing very simple things that fix the problem and i think that uh really puts a light to what we are capable of i don't think um uh everything needs to go to the hospital i think uh knowing what needs to go to the hospital is super important and knowing how to identify small problems before they get big problems super important but it's so teachable it's it's very teachable and i feel like um uh, knowing gold standards in, let's say, stopping a, a massive bleed or really knowing um, how to gear up for cold weather survival, like all those things you don't need any fancy equipment for. They help. But if you don't know the reason behind that, um, you run out of that one resource and you're, you're, you're shit out of luck, you know? So that's what we're, we're teaching. Uh, we go very basic and then we go advanced. But our, our goal is uh, so that uh, people with, uh, let me, maybe a, a trauma kit or something like that could potentially um, help out with like the top six things that can kill you within mm. uh, the day. Mm. Yeah. I guess having the knowledge is really half the battle and then all the gear is just supplemental, right? Yep. Yep. So I, I feel like uh, a lot of these uh, people over there that don't have a lot of resources, we're really good at improvising things and, uh, and uh, doing fairly well. Now their death rates obviously a lot higher than ours mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the lack of uh, healthcare. Um, but at the same time, I, I saw them get some pr pretty bad, like th these are people who uh, patrol uh, to prevent hyenas and lions from touching their stuff, you know? So they, they get into some good scraps, you know, and they're, they're able to, to hold their own. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's, it's hearkening back to the old days, you know, out West or whatever, when you would, uh, you get thrashed up you go see the old doctor in town and who knows what he would do or if he was a real doctor, but he patched you back up somehow. Right. Yep. Yep. It's, um, it's a fascinating thing. So if we're talking about medicine here, specifically emergency medicine mm -hmm. and guys and girls out there thinking, you know, I really need to get more training on this. Um, where should they kind of start? Absolutely. So, um, there's stop the bleed campaign. That's free training. So stop the bleed. Uh, learn how to do that because if you think about, um, I'm not sure if uh, any of your followers are like familiar with like the survival rule of threes, but like the first thing is oxygenation, right? Three minutes without oxygen. What carries oxygen? Your blood. So if you're bleeding out and it's a massive bleed for three minutes, you're a goner, you know? Um, so Stop the Bleed is a free campaign. Um, I'm not sure if they're offering any online stuff right now, but that's something that I teach uh, very uh, often on my uh, different channels. Um, but if you want to, to get trained up, from, um, from, a, from someone who teaches that, it should be free in your community. And then CPR training is uh, so, so vital because here in the States, what do we have? We have a lot of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol issues, um, and a lot of people having heart attacks. Yeah. Like a lot of people having heart attacks. So uh, knowing how to <clears throat> check a pulse and to do CPR it is going to save someone's life uh, if that happens to you. And uh, more times than not, it's, uh, it does happen. Um, whether that's on an airplane or uh, in a yeah. shopping mall or something like that. Um, so that's kind of your basics. Um, now, if you want to get a little more training, there's something called uh, the TCCC. Uh, a lot of military people are familiar with that, but there are uh, civilian uh, TCCC uh, instructors. And then there's um, also people like me who offer a lot of free content online. Uh, right now, I'll be, um, um, I've just opened up online primer courses for in-person training. Right. So on online primer is kind of like uh, just getting the basics on all the things that can kill you super fast um, and the kit that you need, whether that's uh, the gold standard or how to improvise those uh, gold standards. And then um, you, you know how you uh, drill up in the military, you go over scenarios, over scenarios, you're changing out leaders and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that uh, very uh, similarly in the ER and also um, in the wilderness medicine as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, to put that context in the field and run real scenarios and re put them in real situations where they're actually having to transport people in ravines and stuff and really feeling how their body functions when they're hurt, they're tired, they're sweating, they're hungry, um, and uh, how they have to operate in a very safe and controlled environment and to do it over and over again. That's what our in-person training is going to be like. So it's a little mix of military, a little mix of uh, medicine. Um, and uh, right now we're, I'm only offering it to people that I know personally. Um, and then, uh, we're going to open that up to the public in the near future. I, uh, I think that's an amazing idea. And, you know, at some point when the whole COVID situation gets under control, I'd love to come out there and 
do some filming and see what you guys are doing out there because yeah, I, I frankly cool. speaking, you know, I've, I've run the gamut of civilian training when it comes to shoot them up and, but there's not enough T triple C medical first aid type stuff mm -hmm. out there unless you want to pay an arm and a leg for it. So, yep, absolutely. So and I was, I was, um, I was talking to one of my uh, buddies who's active duty out in uh, New York and he was uh, in uh, um, Iraq twice and uh, one of his buddies got shot up and uh, while he was providing cover, he looks over and there's uh, two or three people standing around the guy that got shot in the neck. They don't know what the fuck to do. You know, they got the training, they got this certification, but they don't drill it enough for you to be like split second. This is what I'm going to do. And uh, so even people who have training and I, I would bargain, even physicians put in that situation in, in a survival situation, will they falter? I, I would bet money that they will, because again, they're not trained up. You put a physician in a military context, it's the same thing. Military docs are, are, are raised different, you know, yeah. put them in a survival situation. Um, the military doctors will do better. Uh, but civilian doctors, civilian people, just in general, um, there, there's a big gap. There's a big gap. Well, it's a totally different environment and, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a totally different skill set as well, I think. And I'm not sure about the whole medical side of it, although a little bit, but I know just, you know, <laughs> once rounds start coming at you and things start happening, um, yep. I've, heard it's a, I've heard it's a different experience, which oh, is, yeah. you know, TCCC, I think is one of the more valuable things that, you know, all our sheepdog type people out there could do because, it bridges that gap of I've got my CPR AED and I've got, you know, my Red Cross first aid or whatever to, okay, now I can start to like, you know, assess, do my blood sweeps, uh, pack yeah. an actual, all of that stuff that you really need to know in a combat scenario, uh, mm -hmm. you can get T triple C. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great, I mean, that's a great move for you to offer to people all mm -hmm. of this training. Now, do you ever sleep, man? I mean, you, you're a doctor, you're a resident, like you're doing yeah. all this stuff. Where do you find the time? So I feel like uh, right now it's less of a time, right? Like the, the whole thing for anyone listening and uh, anyone um, kind of wanting to do more with their life. It's, um, it's surprising on how much the mission drives you. You know, when you're at home, you come home from work, you're tired, um, you have to think about exercising. I have a dog. I have to walk the dog. You have to think about eating. Uh, but in all of that kind of like delirium of tiredness and hunger, you're like that one idea related to your mission is like, oh, this would be really cool. Or like, uh, I know my learners would want this or would really appreciate this. And then you, you it, it's like the engine just restarts. Mm. And um, so I, I think it's less of time and uh, more of motivation and organization. So I'm able to do what I'm able to do because um, I love it. And uh, number two is I'm not uh, doing BS stuff, you know, like I am on social media, but uh, I'm on social media to educate uh, and to produce value for people. Uh, so uh, I try, it's hard, but I try not to get stuck in the scroll game, you know? Yeah, man, it, it, it'll get you. Um, but yeah, Doc, I honestly, there's so many people out there that are doing what you're doing, but they're not doing it in the way that you're doing it. And what I mean when I say that is it's tough. You get trapped in the I need to put out content game, but then the more content you need to put out, the less valuable it becomes, right? Yeah. I haven't seen you have that problem thus far. Everything I've seen you put out is relevant. It's, you know, it's pertinent. Um, that might be because you're an actual physician, but that might also just be because you really have an understanding of what the layman needs to learn, which is, it's not always, doesn't always go hand in hand, a doctor, and then somebody who knows what the layman on the street or the soldier yeah. in the field needs to know. How did you kind of, how did you get that understanding? Absolutely. I think that's a great question because, uh, it kind of goes all the way back to childhood because, uh, my parents thought I was slow. I don't know what the uh, huh. correct term to use nowadays <laughs> is, but uh, I wasn't the brightest kid, you know. Um, but as you can uh, kind of figure out from uh, the things that I've done now, uh, when I get motivated, I don't care if I'm not the smartest person. I'll figure out how to do it. Um, and I think that trumps uh, anything else. Um, so I think I'm able to connect with a lot of laymen because I've been in the infantry, you know. You don't get any more laymen than that, you know. <laughs> Um, and, uh, in addition to that, like I have all these experiences in uh, other countries where, um, I think the, when you break down to it, you just need to be a, a genuine human being. And once you connect at that level, you kind of understand where people are, are coming from. 
Um, at the same time, like I've been homeless as well, like during med school, I was homeless for almost a year. Um, so like, I, I don't judge, like, I, I think everyone has a story, even if they're bitching and moaning in the ER, like, and being a dick. So it, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, I'm probably going to find out what that backstory is. And because I didn't judge you at the beginning, we end up shaking hands at the end of it. Yeah. And that's another really big thing, I think, in life, just for guys to, to learn eventually is, you know, you, you always want to end it on shaking hands and kind of making a new alliance. You never want to have those enemies out there. And typically you find that the enemies are, it was a stupid freaking thing. And now it's just a prideful thing that you don't want to like make up with the guy, right? It's, yeah, you live and you learn. Absolutely. So where survival doctors going from here? I mean, you guys are on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sounds like you have only plans to expand. Yeah. That's a hundred percent right. So right now uh, we're working on um, getting our like followers. So the people who are very keen on learning this type of stuff educated, because uh, to be honest, like even though I produce a lot of good content and uh, even though like all of it together is great and you might remember a little uh, uh, things here and there, if I were to put my kid through the same type of content training where it's batched a little bit on YouTube, a little bit on Instagram, uh, would I be confident that they could save a life? No, no, they need proper training for that. Uh, so that's what we're developing right now. Uh, so we have these um, uh, inner circle uh, visual uh, live sessions and then visual, uh, video modules, um, kind of drills to do. And then um, if there's uh, enough people who want to do in-person training, uh, we go over a lot of the, that stuff too. So it's kind of TCCC in a survival situation. Um, so that's going to, the, the first uh, batch of people who are going through this are going to be in February. And since I, I have a crazy schedule, uh, I'm going to be looking out for uh, other uh, physicians, other people who are trained in, in TCCC who want to uh, help out with the in-person stuff. Uh, but we're doing online first and then some uh, um, in-person stuff as well. That sounds really exciting. Um, you know, just because you can't get out right now to tactical training or whatever it is, uh, you know, I used to spend quite a bit of time training in person uh, before the mm -hmm. pandemic hit. But I found that if you just go online and take courses like this, it's amazing how much it'll refresh you. If hearing the information and nothing else, yeah. but you need to do it. Um, all of my EMTs and EMRs even out there, I think EMRs, but nurses, RNs, all the people in the medical field are going to know about, you know, recertifying and getting your CEUs done and all of that. But for guys and girls out there who, who don't have to do that, you still have to keep fresh on your yep. medical training, on your, you know, mapping, your mm -hmm. navigate, whatever it is. You need to go over it, you know, once a year, once a quarter, once a whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, Dr. Tan, I really think that the way you're doing it, um, you know, virtually right now is a great resource. How can guys and girls sign up for that if they want to? So the best way to do that, um, you go to www.survivaldoctors.com. Okay. So again, it's plural because we're a team. Um, and uh, over there, you can uh, kind of sign up for uh, kind of our free training and uh, go to our Facebook group because that's where our core people, that's where we're going to release uh, the, um, the opening spots first. Now, when I say like, I don't want uh, to, to open up to everyone, it's because I want that one-on-one face-to-face -on -face time where if people have very specific questions, um, we can answer it because uh, right now um, I, I, I want to do it in batches almost. Mm. Uh, so that um, let's say the first team that I'm uh, putting through this, um, they have very similar kind of training levels and questions. Um, so if I do the same thing with someone who's super advanced and someone who's just starting that course um, or that live interaction um, may go over someone's head and it might be a waste of time for some people. So I try to batch them together in groups. No, that's a great idea. Um, doing it by skill set. I think that's mm -hmm. incredibly smart. Now, are we going to need anything? Uh, do we need mm -hmm. you know, some training gauze or anything like that mm -hmm. to attend? So uh, the first course that we're uh, putting out, so this is uh, our paid course, uh, we're going to include uh, a, a custom trauma kit from North American Rescue. So oh, we wow. partnered with North American Rescue wow. and uh, as our special thank you, because all of this, for me, I'm a resident. I basically make the salary of a teacher right now. And then uh, to, to say like, 
I, I need money to build a website and stuff like that. That's not happening right now. So that's the, the, the whole purpose of pushing out these uh, courses and to offer these spots is so that we can develop the things to make this long term. Hmm. So uh, that being said, like the course amount, that's our pre-sale stuff, our pre-sale um, uh, cost. And that includes a $280 like kit from North American Rescue. Um, so you pay for the course. I like the, the, the organization itself, Survival Doctors gets a very small fee to help with all these stuff to develop the thing. But you get a big old trauma pack with uh, basically two of everything. Um, and it's directly from North American Rescue. So it's, it's what the, the U.S. Army uses. It's what I trust and what I use. Uh, so that's what I want my learners to, to get as well. Ladies and gentlemen, North American Rescue is the place to go for this type of stuff. They're the cat's meow. Um, so you'd be crazy to pass up an opportunity like this. Uh, I don't say that a lot when it comes to my get, like if I don't believe it, but this is a really, really cool pre product and package you guys are putting out. Uh, so go to your Facebook group, uh, check it out, survivaldoctors.com. Uh, they're going to be directed, I take it, from there to the Facebook group. And yep. Awesome, man. Awesome. Um, so are there any kind of wrapping up here? Cause I want to let you get to, you know, eat and shower and all that, but yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, no doubt, man. Um, but mm -hmm. I really want to ask you one last question here, doctor, what mm -hmm. could you give us as closing thoughts for whatever we're going to face next in this crazy 2021 year? Um, give us just kind of some, some closing thoughts and mm -hmm. I'll leave it at you. Yeah, this year has been crazy. And um, I think it's an awakening for many people. And I think we should take it in stride. We shouldn't be scared of what's going to happen, but we should be prepared for what's going to happen. I feel like that um, takes it back, take back control over your life and over your family's safety, I think, because there's so many people who are anxious, scared, and uh, just not knowing what's going to happen. Uh, but I think there's uh, very easy options to, to take back control. And that's uh, what we're hoping to offer. We're not trying to sell courses here. We're trying to build a community. And I think that's what uh, that's what's going to stay true for as long as this company is going to exist. Outstanding. Survivaldoctors.com. Survival Doctors on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok. And... Dr. Tan, Dr. Nicholas Tan, I thank you, sir, so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Guys, until next time, I want you to remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will see you in the next Tactical Podcast.